Hello, and welcome to the Scaling Therapy Practice. This is James Marland, your host. This is the show where we encourage you to take small steps towards big growth. I have three things at the top of the show for you today. First, I attended the webinar with Daniel Fava on SEO, and man, was I impressed. Like, I learned things um, that I was surprised to learn. Uh, he had some tools in there, um, Google Analytics and Google Search Console. And I, I took a look at my my web page and I could tell I need some work on my SEO. And it was just pretty amazing to get that insight just in a little a little webinar. So what I learned from that webinar was Daniel Fava knows his SEO. He has a uh, some some classes to help you on his web page. I have that link in the show notes. Uh, but I was just really impressed with um, what he what he knows and his support. So uh, that he has a course that's starting soon. SEO Basecamp. I think there's a, it's like limited to ten or fifteen people, and the cart closes Sunday or Monday. So I'm going to push this episode out a day early uh, Sunday so that if you are interested, you can take a look and see if they have any seats left. So yeah, head on over to that. The second announcement is we are changing the format of the show to a panel show. Uh, David Hall, Dr. David Hall is stepping back a little bit. He'll still be, still be a special guest for some episodes, but we are going to be uh, doing a panel show with three different panel members from the SciCraft Network with four different opinions on scaling and the stories that we have, the mistakes we've made, the lessons we've learned along the way. I am really excited to begin starting that. The first, uh, we're going to do this in seasons. We're going to have 12 episodes on one topic. The first one is marketing for mental health and the the episodes are going to be things on like social media, going to conferences, webinars, how to get word of mouth and customer reviews, marketing your therapist, marketing your services, public speaking, SEO, web pages, email lists, and a few other items. If there's a topic that you're super interested in with marketing or you have questions, about marketing, please send them to james at coursecreationstudio.com. That's james at coursecreationstudio.com. And I will uh, be sure to respond to those and work them into the show. I really want some audience participation about some real issues, real struggles, real problems, or maybe even a tip that you have that really worked out for you. So definitely uh, email james at coursecreationstudio.com. And the final thing is, I'm going to, as I was re-listening to the show, Joe was talking about living the life you want to live. And I'm going to put in the show notes a link to a resource that is sort of like a journal page where you can ask several questions to yourself to assess your day or assess your week, and then just a place where you could put an action step which is, am I, am I going, what am I going to do to move closer to the lifestyle I want to live? And what is one thing I can modify, delete, delegate that is taking me away from the lifestyle I want to live? I really enjoyed that. It was like just a five minute uh, segment with him on um, living your best life. And it made an impression. And I think we, we, do things in our work and our daily life where we are just reacting. I'm just reacting to what's going on. And all of a sudden it's like a current that pulls you further away, further and further away from what you want to do. So what are some of the things that I can actively do to build the life I want to live? Cause I'm the one responsible for it, right? I'm responsible for building my life and building my business. And uh, just an example one of the things uh, that I've had intentions of doing to build the life I want to do is uh, build a, a stronger relationship with my wife. Our son is 
18. Nope, he's 19 and he's working full time. He's out of school. And before you know it, he's going to be out of the house, whether that's a month to five years. I don't really know. He's sort of a, a free spirit that way. But it's going to happen. So what am I going to do intentionally to build the life that I want to live? I want to have a strong relationship with my wife, even after, you know, the the energy and the craziness of a, a semi semi adult in the house is living in the house when he's gone. You know, what what are we going to focus our attention on? And so I need to intentionally build in to build in activities. Uh, that will lead me closer to a to what I want out of life, which is a strong relationship um, it, in this new phase of our life. So that's one thing that I'm going to do. I'm going to um, make this uh, resource available on the show notes page. You don't have to subscribe to the newsletter to get it. But if you happen to want to subscribe to the newsletter, I'll just click one of the links that get you get get you get you a subscription to the newsletter and I'll I'm going to be trying to put more of those resources in the newsletters as uh they come up every week there's uh some awesome note or resource from the from from our guests so okay all right so those are the three things let's get into our show with Joe Sanek uh he's going to talk about audience building and the 3P method it is fantastic i hope you enjoyed the show let's get on with it Thanks for joining us for the Scaling Therapy Practice. This is James Marland. I have a special guest, Joe Sanek from Practice of the Practice, among other things. Hello, Joe. How's it going today? Great. I'm very excited to have you on the show today. We're going to talk about other things, audience and audience building, especially for people who are thinking about doing a side hustle or launching a course or a podcast. Joe is an expert at those. We'll get into that. Um, let me introduce Joe in my own way. He's the author of Thursday's the New Friday, How to Work Fewer Hours, Make More Money, and Spend Time Doing What You Want. Uh, he has Practice of the Practice podcast, Practice of the Practice services. There, there's just so much, so much that he does and is doing. But my story about Joe is I did a, a summit. It was called Scale Up Summit about three or four years ago. And he was a, he was a, a speaker. And something went wrong with like his housing or like he was supposed to be at a place to uh, uh, podcast to be the presenter and it didn't work out. But instead of canceling, he pulled off to the side of the road and did the did his speech, you know, did his presentation right there, which I was so it was so encouraged and blessed to have him there. Like he's just a, a friend of the community, a friend of me. And so that is my. That's my introduction for Joe Sanic. Oh, thanks so much with that. You know, I forgot about that moment, but now that you say it, it comes back of the, the internet went out while we were living on yep. the road during the pandemic. So <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, could, I was like, but he didn't cancel. He just made it work. And I'm just, you know, so grateful for that. So before we get into our, our topic, let's do a tool, tip, or tech. I'll go first, and I've been reading this. Well, it's Audible. I do everything on Audible now. The Six Habits of Growth by Brendan Burchard. It's, it's free if you subscribe to their book of the month for Audible. So I just picked it up, and one of the uh, habits that he talks about is motivation. Like, you have to have motivation every day to work and get to work and be... to to stay on target, stay productive. And he just, he recommends some tips and tools on just who are you working for? What are you going for? It's not just work or money, just what, what is important to you and make that your motivation, but don't just do it, you know, at once a year, January 1st, do it daily and have things that remind you habits that remind you of what you're working for, what you're working towards. And I just found that so meaningful because because working a, a business can be such a grind sometimes. So to stay to stay motivated, have something. It, it's basically have something you're working for that is bigger than yourself. And that is my tip. Any comments on that, Joe? I love I love that. I think that, yeah, when we know our why, when we know like, 
what is enough is enough. I think especially as a business owner, you could always do more therapy. You could always hire more clinicians. You can always do better SEO. There, there is always something. And, you know, to just know, okay, like if I'm doing this to serve my kids or my family, mm-hmm. and then I never see my kids and my family, that's a bit hypocritical. And so I, I love that idea of having your why be front and center and, and knowing when enough is enough. Awesome. So have I, what is your tool tip or tech this week? Yeah, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dovetail off of what you said, where I've really been loving the Waking Up app that Sam Harris puts out. And so it's a awesome app that has, you know, meditation and different trainings in it. And I've been really liking the Alan Watts series. So Alan Watts is a speaker that was really big in the 60s and 70s and has, and he recorded hundreds of hours of teachings. And just yesterday, I was on a walk listening to him speak, and he was just talking about really you know, the goal of so many things, whether it's, you know, religion or business or, you know, self-development is basically to be present. You know, it it always points back to just appreciating the present. And so that idea of, you know, if we're always working and always doing like all these tasks and kind of what you were saying, you know, what's the point of it? And so for me, it's really helped me stay grounded and to be like, we get to be human. It took billions and trillions of years to get to this point that you and I can be talking on a computer screen to each other on a podcast, like literally for this to happen took like quadrillion years. That's amazing. And to just sit in that amazement and say, we get to do really good work in the world and we get to be human has been a great reminder recently for me when I get stressed out or feel like I'm not enough or whatever the thing is that is like, really, Joe, like you get to be human. Awesome. So it's called the wake up app. Yeah, it's called the Waking Up app. They have a, a daily meditation each day, and that's kind of how it started. And then they've added different trainings on top of it. And it's an amazing app. Cool. That, that's one of the, that's another habit from the book is wake up and do some meditation or something to center yourself from, from the habits book I was saying. All right, yeah. before we get into some of the topics, what's new with Practice of the Practice? I, I, haven't, I haven't been to a conference in about a year, so I'm a, a little out of touch. What's, what's new with the, your podcast or the, the, the business? Yeah, you know, during the pandemic and afterwards, we were really launching a lot of products and supports to help clinicians and seeing what stuck as the world was really changing. And I would say the last year, year and a half has really been focused on just operationally cleaning up the business. <clears throat> so we're doing a really big website update in the next month or so. It'll look completely different, but way more amazing because we have a full IT team now on staff. We're doing a lot more just forward facing types of things. Something we're working on that has yet to launch, um, but eventually will, is a uh, text course uh, where people are going to get a daily text called 40 Days to Full. And so we're developing that where it's just going to be a daily like work on this and then, you know, five days of really good content around, you know, getting full and then two days because we want you to take at least uh, two days off a week of just encouragement around slowing down. So we're working on that right now. We don't have a landing page or anything for it yet, but you know, the main practice of the practice website, will have that there, or we'll be, you know, letting all of our email lists know. So yeah, just getting creative, finding ways to kind of increase our operational systems. Sam, who's been with us for, I think five years at this point has moved into an operations role. And we, I have a new executive assistant who's taken on a ton as well. So it's, it's been exciting to see the behind the scenes get cleaned up so we can just really keep scaling. Yeah, as you grow, you tend to have policies, procedures, paperwork, or things that just sort of linger until you clean it up. So that's that's really exciting. I'm looking forward to the new web page. I thought your web page was fine, but if it's going to be better, <laughs> it's even even more cool. And then the staff, you know, it sounds like you've been growing your staff too and giving them new responsibilities. All right. So my, my first question. Before we get into the audiences, yeah, I did read Thursdays, the new Friday, and the big takeaway for me is just an awareness of how, you know, grindy work can be and uh, how I just assume this is the way it is. But even after reading it, and maybe maybe other people have talked about this in the past, I still I still feel guilty when I don't put in my eight to 10 hours or I leave messages for the weekend or I don't respond to that text at 10 o'clock at night from customers or clients. Do you have any insight for me on why or why we still feel that way where 
we know we should slow down. We know we should prioritize. Even my tip in the beginning, you know, prioritize what's important. But then we, then we still have those feelings of guilt or loss when we we're not doing what we think we should be doing. Do you have any just a brief comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think for one, it's really normal, right? And so let's just normalize it. That you know, James, you're not the the freak out there who is having a hard time implementing it. So. <laughs> We just normalize it like a good therapist. But I would say all of those feelings are internal. It may have come from a parent. It may have come from a school Mm -hmm. system. It may have come from our religion. But it's still inside of you and you have that control over how you react to it. So thinking about what are we avoiding and what are we seeking in that behavior? And so the whole I didn't work, you know, eight to 10 hours today. Is it avoiding, you know, this fear of, you know, my business is going to fall apart or it's going to not have the operations or I, I have such potential I'm seeking. I can see this business just explode, but, and there's so much potential there for it. And I'm really excited about that. Like really figuring out, am I avoiding something that I just need to work on? Like, you know, maybe I was raised, you know, in a household where, you know, even on the weekend, it was like, we don't sit still, you know, we, we do chores on the weekend and then we go to soccer games and you've been raised in an environment where slowing down genuinely is looked down upon. Okay, well, that that then warrants some evaluation. Is that what you want? You know, maybe that is something that someone says, no, I, I want to live a nonstop 24-7 life and that's the life I want. I would say most people don't want that, but to just evaluate it and say, like, is the life that I'm creating what I actually want? To have some intention around it. And then in the proactive side, if we really realize, you know, the things that we're proactively trying to create are actually getting created slower because of the behavior we're doing. So you spending, you know, two or three extra hours on a Friday afternoon or evening, you know, doing email, yeah. that's attracting bad clients that expect emails at, you know, 6 p.m. on a Friday, which then is going to attract other bad clients that expect emails at 6 p.m. on a Friday, which then means you need to have assistants that are going to be responding at 6 p.m. on a Friday. And so the behavior that we do is then moving us farther away from the thing we're actually seeking. And, and so you know, even just looking at my own staff, you know, I'm taking a bunch of vacations in the summer of 2023. And my staff have said to me, seeing that on your calendar, actually, it helps me feel permission to go take more vacations or for me to slow down a little bit and for me to do better work rather than them feeling like, why aren't you in the office, Joe? I have attracted people that, you know, this past week, Sam, our operations person, she and her family were dealing with a lot of sickness. I hope she didn't feel guilty taking a week off to mend and heal and get better. So, then I'm creating the thing I'm seeking, which is a business that's holistic, it's well-rounded, it's, it's good for the people that work with me and for me. And then, you know, hopefully, you know, when things come up, I, I also have the insight to go do my own therapy, do my own work on that stuff. So you're, you, the question, the question that stuck with me is, are you actively creating the life that you want? You know, are, are your behaviors and habits supporting or detracting from who you want to be. And yeah, I do, I do recognize that growing up, you know, you worked on Saturday, you didn't waste any time, just busy all the time. You know, I have brought that forward into this life. And, you know, is that, is that what I really want? So great, great insight there. Well, thank you for that. Thanks you for indulging me on that question. So we want to talk about audiences and building audiences. And you have had, you've built many audiences over the years, not just as, as a therapy practice, but podcast, consult, consulting, services. The, the book was an audience. Like m- there's probably more that I'm missing, but all these audiences. And I just wanted to talk about that and get pick your brain a little bit about, you know, what, what you should do. But, but for the person, you know, I want you to talk to the person who's thinking about launching a podcast or launching a product or doing an online course or doing a CE unit, why should the entrepreneur want to build an audience? Shouldn't they just, this is a facetious question. Shouldn't they just release it out there and people will come to it? So why, why should we worry about this? Yeah. And this is one of the most common things I hear from, you know, whether I'm doing pre-consulting calls with someone that's looking at doing consulting with me or folks that want to build passive income. You know, people like you and I are are highly trained in creating things. You know, all through grad school, it's you know you're writing papers, you're 
you know, creating hypothetical programs or groups. You know, a lot of us worked in nonprofits where you're, you're building systems or you're creating things that are products to, you know, foster kids or, you know, whoever the audience was in these nonprofits or community mental health. So we are trained to create products and to be seen as an expert in that area. That's not a bad thing, but that is not at all how the business world works. And if anything, that stands in the way of you being successful. And so when you create an e-course and you say, okay, here's my trauma e-course and you have no audience, every potential audience member, you're squeezing into that e-course. You're saying, I think you, as someone that needs to learn about trauma, needs to take my e-course. Well, what if that person wants some sort of live feedback? What if they want to, you know, have a self-paced, you know, book that they could read? What if they, you know, aren't a course learner, they're an auditory learner, and you've attracted a bunch of people that learn differently than what you've created, you're going to then be saying to your audience, let me squeeze you into this thing that you don't need. Whereas if we flip it and we say, let's first build an audience, let's have that audience grow. Let's do a, a very clear process on deciding what that audience wants to purchase, what needs they have go through that process and then launch a product that that audience tells us they want to buy, it almost ensures that we're going to sell out that product right from the beginning. Mm. So the, the, the best course in the world doesn't make anything without an audience. Yeah, I would argue that, you know, there's a few flash in the pans that maybe right. someone just got, got lucky. You know, they, they create some sort of great course and it gets some buzz and takes off. But that's not the normal story. You know, a lot of people think, oh, if I have a podcast, all of a sudden I'm going to you know, get all these sponsors and that's going to be the thing. Or, you know, for me, it was like, you know, if I get a HarperCollins book and a Harvard Business Review you know, article, that's going to make it. It's still hard work. You know, mm -hmm. it's like even, you know, that builds credibility. It gives me access to different audiences, but it still takes hard work to say, is the audience I'm attracting, do I even have products that line up with that? Or do we need to build different things? And so. You know, these these bullets that we think are going to just be the thing is just not the reality of what it is for most people building a business. It it You said it takes work. It takes work, you know, and the, there's that I get when I started looking about creating courses and podcasts, uh, like all these all these ads in Facebook started popping up, you know, take my twenty dollar course and you have passive income forever and you won't have to work like it was sort of like inundated with ads for do this one thing one time and you're gonna you know you're gonna be set but to your point it, it building a business and building an audience it takes work and the 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 people who make it with one you know one shot doing one thing or going viral that is that's not it's not normal you got to work at it yeah and also you think about if you build a course and you kind of cram everyone into it and then you know, 80% of the people don't even complete the course. Right. And then you don't get any good reviews on the course. You don't have these people saying, oh my gosh, this was exactly what I needed. Versus you have an audience, you listen to that audience, you then build what that audience wants, and then they actually want to complete the course that they helped design, that they helped be a part of. You're going to get better reviews. You're going to have people say, this is 100% what I needed compared to just this way of, I'm going to kind of throw spaghetti at the wall and see what happens and hope that somebody buys it. Like it, it's just not, if you actually want to be serious about making money and, you know, impacting the world, you know, going through the audience building first is the way that, that you ensure that you're making something and not wasting a ton of time and money on making a course that no one buys. Yeah. So how do you, how do you find and how do you listen to your audience? Do you have any advice on that? Yeah. So I'll, I'll go through our three P process. Um, so that's okay. assuming that you already have an audience and then we can always go backward and say, how do you build that audience if you want to go there? So assuming you have an audience, which I define as having at least 500 people on an email list. And so, you know, just having direct access to an audience, we're going to go through some steps with the mindset of we're trying to validate this idea and to kill the idea before we get too far down the road with it. So the first thing is that we set up interviews with at least 20 people. And so we set an email out that says something like, Hey, you've been on you know, my email list that's all about parents that are raising anxious teenagers, and I'm planning to create a, a course, a community, you know, something this fall, and I'm asking my audience to just meet with me to chat about you know, this idea. This isn't a sales pitch. I'm literally just going to ask you questions about what you would want, and it's going to be 20 to 30 minutes. You know, would you click this Calendly link to schedule a time to chat with me? 
And you want to do this over a short period of time, no longer than two weeks. You don't want it to be that you interview one person, you know, at the beginning of the month, another at the end of the month. You want to have all these 20 interviews, minimum of 20, you know, in at least a two week or shorter period of time. You're just full tilt interviewing people like crazy. The reason is then you can start to see trends a lot easier as you're talking to that many people. So first thing is, is your audience engaged? Do you even get 20 people that will talk to you? If it's no, then you have a disengaged audience and you can kill the idea because if they won't even talk to you for free to share where they need help, they're probably not going to buy a course or anything else. And so you're ruling out like, okay, they're inactive or you get these 20 people. So what does that call look like? I recommend a phone call instead of a Zoom call so that you can take notes and you don't have to worry about like eye contact or good lighting and that you let them know I'm going to be typing out your answers in, in a Google Doc to just keep track of it. So the three P's, the first P is pain. So you want to ask them, you know, what's it been like as a parent in this example, a parent uh, that has an anxious teen. And then they, in their words, are saying, you know, I just feel like it should be easier than this. They struggle in school. I know they're a smart kid, but you know, they're so anxious. I wish they would date or like whatever it is that they use to describe that anxiety as a parent. Then the second P is product. So what would a, if there was a magical product that helped you in some way, and then you reflect back that pain. So you said that you wish that your son would date, but he just gets so anxious. Like he doesn't even go to parties or, you know, really have many friends. If there was some magical product for you to help coach him or for him, what would that look like? And you just kind of just throw it out there. They may say, you know, if I just had like a weekly support group for parents, that would be so helpful. Or if I had some experts I could talk to they'll start to tell you the kinds of things they would want in that ideal product. And over time, you're then going to see that there's certain trends that you start to see that do they prefer live? Do they prefer kind of at their own pace? Or do they want it to be very, very niche specific, like how to help an anxious teen boy date? Or is it more broad, like, you know, you know anxious parents? And then the last P is, is payment. How much would they pay? So what would the price be for this? So you reflect back again, that pain. You said this was the pain. You then said, this is that magical product. Imagine I offered all of that. Like, what would you pay for that? You know, they may say $49 one time. They may say a hundred bucks a month. They may say a thousand bucks a month. I did this exact process when I was thinking about launching a podcast school, like an e-course. So eventually we did podcast launch school, but I went through this process with a bunch of my consulting clients. They had come to slow down school. They're one-on-one -on -one consulting clients. So they had invested you know, ten dollars to $20,000 already in practice of the practice and developing themselves. And went through this whole process with them thinking that they'd want a self-paced e-course that I'd charge a thousand bucks for. And at the end, they said, honestly, Joe, I know you know how to do podcasts. We would just love for your team to do all the editing, all the show notes. Mm -hmm. I just show up and record and I don't have to do anything. And when I got to the price, I, I thought, like, there's no way we can afford to do what they're asking. And I said, how much would you pay if our team did this? And they almost universally, people said, I don't know, eighteen to $20,000. And I was like, what? Like, how many episodes would have to be included? And so we walked through that. And within two days, I landed four people that had already paid me $20,000. I mean, $80,000 in four days. Now I had to hire an audio engineering staff. I had to hire a show notes coordinator, all of that. But it was, I knew that it was the thing that these people wanted instead of making some course that they would never complete. So then you have the so, price. So and you God, took this idea, like this concept, and and before you made anything, you sold $80,000 of stuff? Yes. Just with this very, this simple, it seems simple. Yeah. What is it? P pain. What's the second P? Product. Product and then is it price the third one? Yep. Pain, product, yep. price. Yep. And just listening. You're just listening to what they want and trying to figure out, you know, what what is the what's the what can I help you with? Like it's like, what do they want? How do I build it? What would you pay for it? Type of thing. It's really yeah. cool. Like it yeah, takes so some right of the after those, frustration out. It does. And right after those interviews. You know, I then send a summary email to, you know, all 20 people, BCC, you don't want to have everyone's emails in there. Mm -hmm. Just be respectful. Just say, you know, summary of the interviews, like, thanks so much for being a part of these interviews. I've done, you know, 20 some interviews over the last week. Here are the main themes of the pain. Here are the main themes of the product. Here are the main themes of the price. And then say, here's what I'm offering. You know, I'm going to be launching, you know, this done for you podcasting. And, you know, it's going to cost $20,000 eventually, you know, for this group, it's going to be 18 split into two payments. You know, we're starting with just four people. 
here's exactly what's going to be in that. And then if you want to be on the wait list, or you might even say, if you want to buy right now, click here. And so you decide, are you going to do a wait list model or are you going to have them buy right then? And then if people don't buy, that tells you, okay, I just interviewed 20 people that said they want a done for you podcast. But then when it came time to it, I reflected back exactly what they said, but they didn't pull out their credit cards. Good thing I didn't hire a whole sound engineering team. Good thing I didn't hire, you know, someone that would transcribe episodes and all this stuff. So then you can see, okay, now I have 80 grand in the business for this done for you podcasting and and to let them know I'm going to be building this team after I have the clients. So here's what that's going to look like over the next nine months. We're going to be doing these things. By the end, you'll have 26 podcast episodes. It'll be launched. It'll be on iTunes. You know, whatever the thing was, you know, for, for mm-hmm. the podcasting done for you. That's, that's amazing. I think uh, that just speaks to the, to the wisdom of building your audience first before you build the product, you know, building, yeah. listening, building, figuring out what their pain is and then solving that problem. Because if you can solve their, their pain, if you can solve that problem, the people will be like, okay, what do I need to pay you for? It it won't be like yeah. pulling the money out, you know, pulling the clients out. It's it's they are will they want it? Like, oh, you you have something I want. Mm-hmm. That that's a really important part of launching a, a product or a service. I forgot who said it, but I remember hearing nobody likes to be sold to, but everyone likes to buy. And just that idea of even just observing our own kind of habits of purchasing, like I hate being sold to, but, you know, if I'm going to upgrade a system within practice of the practice, like I want to do it well. And, And so, you know, even recently we've been looking at direct mailers, you know, sending postcards in the mail to people to help get to new audiences. And this mailing company that, you know, has lists of that sort, you know, I reached out to them. And this guy, Justin, was just like, okay, sounds like what you're doing is really cool. Just let me know if you're ready. And if not, like, that's cool too. She's like, okay, thanks, dude. (laughs) Like, It was very simple. No, no high sales. And we'll test it with him probably. It's the customer's journey. Like sometimes I think people are like, we got to get them. You know, we got to get people to buy within 30 days or a week or whatever the, the algorithm says, because that's their window. But everybody's journey is a little different. And if you can provide some support, encouragement, and value along the way, if they're a client that you really want, they are, they're going to stick around, you know, and when they're ready, they will buy. You don't have to pressure them. That's one of the things um, I like about content marketing, I guess it's called, Mm -hmm. is you just demonstrate your value. You give, you demonstrate that you know what you're talking about. You can help people. And when they're ready to buy, they will be like, oh, yeah, I want I want a podcast. I want a course. I want, you know, this, you know, I want to grow a group practice. But how do I how do I sign up? Yeah. I mean, really, like we've shifted so much in the last four years where people would come to us and say, can you help us You know, build an e-course? Can you help us build this to now people have to go through Audience Building Academy or they have to show that they already have an audience before we'll even do yes. any of that support because we know they're not going to be successful. Sure. They might give us, you know, 10 or 20 K, but it's like, if they don't make that back, that makes me look bad and it makes them look bad. Awesome. So turning to like, what just some general questions about audience building, you've built a bunch of things, just two, two questions. What was the hardest audience to build? And what is your, like one of the audiences or products you're proud of? You're like, oh man, we really did a good job with this. Or it was like, Maybe it's not your biggest product, but it's like close to your heart. So what what was hard and what is close to your heart? You know, I I still feel like getting therapists to sign up for emails and free resources is still so hard. Like when people get into most of our products, we get, you know, really great reviews, really great outcomes, like next level practice, our program for people in solo practice, usually yeah. within three months, you know, so 99 bucks a month. So for less than $300 in three months, most people are as full as they want to be. Mm. And, and it's like, you know, over and over, we see that that level of success. And it feels like it should just be way easier at this point to make those sales, to get, you know, hundreds of people per cohort. But it's, it's you know, there's just so many shifts. You know, like a year ago, you know, it seemed like tons of people wanted to be in low-cost membership communities. This last year has been like all one-on-one consulting. You know, that mm. so many people are like, yeah, I'll give you a thousand bucks a month to do consulting. And you're like, 
okay, like we have some great consultants, but you, that's not nearly as scalable as, you know, helping a membership community. So looking at those market trends and, you know, what's shifting and changing to me, it's, it's just, it's still hard. You know, you, you know, people may look at practice the practice and say, oh, it's probably easy for them. No, it's still really difficult to figure out how to get in front of therapists and to get them to realize the value of, of the content that we make or you make or other people make. I talked with, it was maybe a year or two ago, Julie Harris, and she was talking about people who, who go and get coaching and consulting to grow their business and people who don't. And she's, she, you know, it, it's just anecdotally, the people who go their their revenues grow faster and the people who don't, you know, they save the hundred dollars or whatever, but it doesn't grow. So it just speaks to even on like, you know, the data driven assessment, people who engage in growing and spend money on themselves to grow, they, they get a big return on it. So, yeah. I mean, All right. I, even to that point, I remember when I launched my first slowdown school, I had done all this work to sell the first tickets and I only sold one ticket after all this work on the mm -hmm. podcast and everything. And so I hired this lady, Jamie Masters, who has the eventual millionaire podcast. She coached John Lee Dumas and all these other people. And this was when I still had a full-time job, you know, making like 60 K a year, you know, full-time at the college practice. The practice was a side gig. I had my counseling practice and she was $2,000 an hour. And it was like, are you kidding me? Like this better be worth it. I did. She had a minimum of 10 hours. I was like, okay, I'll do 10, 10 hours with you. I can directly track back to that $20,000, at mm -hmm. least 200 K in sales um, mm -hmm. of things. She taught me of ways to structure things of ways to think about things, ways to listen and to do it authentically to who I am as mm -hmm. well, that it wasn't just these like slimy sales tactics. Yeah. And so it, it's like, when you have someone that's a fit, it's like, they can really amplify what you're already doing. Awesome. That. That's amazing. Do you, so I, I want to dovetail on the, the pro, do you have a, a product that's close to your heart, a service that you're, you're like just super proud of? Yeah. You know, I think that next level practice, our membership community for solo practitioners, I just love the iterations we've gone through with it. So it's aimed at people that are in solo practice from that moment they think to themselves, I want to start a solo practice all the way to that moment that they're like, I, I want to do a group practice because then mm -hmm. we have group practice launch, group practice boss, all those other things. And so it really is the beginning of people's journeys. And you know, we have these small groups that people meet in. And you know, I actually was just down in North Carolina and met up with some of our next level practice people. And they're people that they're in small groups together and they you know meet up in person. And it's these communities that are completely outside of me, even though it's within our product that have happened. And then mm -hmm. we have all sorts of trainings every month and, you know, just see the experts we've been able to bring in, like Julie Schwartz Gottman, you know, someone that through grad school, I'm like reading her research. And now I consider a friend, like during my divorce, she's like reached out to me and was like, I'm really sorry. Like, here's some, mm -hmm. some books that might be helpful. And, you know, to, to be able to have these connections with, with leaders in our field and to see people genuinely just growing their practices so quickly in what can often be a very confusing time to build a business, you know, we're not talk, taught this stuff in grad school. So, you know, to come alongside folks and just have them go from this mindset of, I have to be employed by someone else to, whoa, there's a whole world here that I just never even thought existed. And to see those light bulbs go off, like it's so rewarding personally, but it's really just cool to see the outcomes also people have from, from next level practice. Yeah. That's gotta be really rewarding. Um, to, to build those little communities. I get, sometimes I get a little envious maybe or jealous. I see all my therapist friends. Oh, we went, we met up in our community group or we had this mastermind and like this, we saw each other at this conference and here's all our pictures together. It's, it's just something really special about growing your, your just doing something hard together. Like there was another book. I can't remember, like doing things alone is hard doing things in a pack or doing things people doing hard things in a pack with they call it their wolf pack for some reason is it's just much easier and you know that next level practice is just a, an environment to to create you know to put some intentionality behind doing some hard things but doing it with people to get doing it together yeah yeah all right we're kind of 
wrapping up a little bit. Can you, can you have the audience building product? I looked it up. It looks like it's, it, you're taking names right now, but can you talk about your audience building products? Yeah. So audience building Academy is a six month program. So we do cohorts of it. So that's why we, we're taking names. Oh, that's why these. it's, yeah. Yeah. So usually it's September and March of each year. So we're dead center at the time of this recording in one of our cohorts. So we don't offer it outside of the cohort because it's a mixed model where you watch videos and then come to the live Q&A mm -hmm. and small group with me. So the way it works is over the six months, we have different milestones every single month. So the first milestone, we look at what's your niche? How much have you researched it? Who else is in that? Who's doing it well? You know, are people that maybe are doing it poorly still successful? Is there no one in that niche? Bouncing ideas off of you know, your ideal clients. How do you do that? And so we really dig into sketching out your niche. Month two, we really focus on building out your email course. So we call it an email course because we have a very kind of clear way that we outline it over a nine part email series so that people have something to point folks to. There's no point in you know, going on podcasts like this and getting all this audience if you don't have a place to capture that audience. If someone listens to this and says, I'm interested in next level practice and you know, they don't get the URL and they, they're just left to their own devices they're probably not going to you know, get on the waiting list. And so you want to have that infrastructure built up before you go get a bunch of media. So we help you uh, build out your email course. And we do that in a small group of, of six people or so that I lead. Then the next phase is getting top media. So how do you respond to help a reporter out? How do you make sure that you have some really good stories that represent different questions? And to almost have a playlist of stories similar to musicians that have a playlist where you're not going to tell every single story you have on a podcast or on an interview, but you know, the three P's thing, that's a question I get, you know, sometimes. And so to be able to walk mm -hmm. through that, but then to also give an example of that, you know, with the you know podcast done for you, those are the sorts of things that you want to have, you know, readily available. And then we walk through, you know, being on podcast interviews, we walk through how do you guest blog, and then we land on hosting your first summit or your first webinar. And so the idea is that first six months, People are really getting an idea of all the ways to build an audience. And then once they go through those first six months, they can come back through for free as long as they want. And so we have people that come through and say, you know, I got most of my email course finished, but I wanted to come through and just get some more feedback on it. Or, you know, they'll pop into just the podcasting one. So it's great because that first six months, you're really just taking it all in, doing your best to keep up. And then you can always go back through it after that. That's that sounds amazing. I like the the structure of it. I like the the milestones. Like, how do I know if I'm progressing? And then you can come back through to get refreshers. That's also because it is overwhelming, especially if you're running a business and hiring people and you know doing all the other doing the family and you know going to ball games and whatever. All that stuff that it could be overwhelming. So coming back through sounds like a great benefit. Well, and even just to get that feedback from other people other yeah. than me, just, just this last week, there's this lady, Carla, who's building out. She has a great um, program. She like a mindset of how she helps people whose children are very difficult. And what we're doing is we're having them practice their origin story. So like, like, why do you care about this? Why do you care about yeah. kids with behavior issues? And she told this story that sounded very, you know, very safe. And so we, we stopped the timer and said, okay, here's what questions we all have. You know, we want to know like, where were you sitting when that tantrum? How old was the kid when that tantrum? And as she told it the second time, she started tearing up and mm. she was apologizing for that. But we're like, no, like this is, this is your story. Like the fact that this is how much you care about your son and you're tearing up over it. Like this is your origin story. Mm. And to see how every single person went from a pretty bland, safe story to like a story that all of us were like, oh my gosh, if we had more than the the time that we have, we would love to hear all of that story. So it's just so cool to see that transformation as people learn how to tell good stories, how to like really take that professional work and and put it into something beyond just their counseling practice. Awesome. That that sounds cool. It sounds like a really neat experience. And just the feedback's probably really from the group is probably invaluable to kind of craft those things. Yeah. All right, we're going to do our one thing. Anything Before we do our one thing, one thing you want people to take away from the episode, you gave me a 28-step checklist to start a private practice. I'll have that link in the show notes. Anything else you want to say about where people can find you or any other thing on your webpage? 
Yeah, I'll just give the link to those two things that I talked about today. So if people are interested in joining Next Level Practice, our next cohort is in September. It's usually September and March that we open those okay. up each year. So even if you're listening to this in the future, that's the rhythm that we typically have. So over at practiceofthepractice.com forward slash invite, you can request that invite. Depending on when this goes live, summer of 2023, we're allowing people to come to the events for free just to check it out. So all that information is going to be on practiceofthepractice.com. And then if you're interested in Audience Building Academy, audiencebuilding.academy is where you can sign up for that next cohort interest list. And you'll, you'll get all the information about that as well. So we have and I'll make it easy. Pod. I'll put those links. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And our podcast is called Practice of the Practice. So we have, we're almost to episode 900 of that podcast. <laughs> Amazing. Is it a weekly one? Uh, in, in 2022, we did it four times a week, and this year we're doing it two times a week. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out how many years that is. <laughs> the while. It, it, yeah, it was, it was January of 2013, so just over 10 years that yeah, awesome. we started it. Great. All right, so let's get into our one thing. Joe, if they could only, if, if the audience here could only remember one thing from the episode, what's the one thing you would want them to take away from our discussion? Hmm. I mean, I would say the one thing I would say is that you are unique and have so many great ideas. And the temptation is to go create things with those ideas. That's not bad that you have the inclination, but if you put a bunch of time and money into something only to have no one buy it. Like that's just a hobby. The world needs to hear what you have to say, but they want to be a part of that journey of creation. And so for you to take the time to build an audience, talk to your audience, have them really be a part of creating whatever products, teachings, things you sell is going to help you be so much more successful than if you just stay in your cave and create things all on your own. Mm, great. And I'm going to go back to the one of the first points is just listen, you know, listen and figure out what people need. See if you can help them with it. Like that's the essence of creating products that people will actually use like they they people want as you said people people want to buy they don't want to be sold to so listen to them listen to what their pain points are and see if you have a skill that helps them like that's a pretty pretty nice way to wrap that up all right well joe thank you for being on the episode thanks so much for having me today this is james with the scaling therapy practice where we encourage our audience to take small steps towards big growth. We'll see you next time. Psych Maven is proud to support the Scaling Therapy Practice Podcast. And if you are someone looking for ideas that are tailored to your own personal style on how to scale and grow your own impact and income as a mental health provider, we hope you might check out our free online assessment. If you go to stp.psychmaven.com, you can take our free personal inventory and find out what your builder type is as a helping professional. This assessment is quick and fun, and it comes with tons of customized resources with your results, so you can discover the best ways to scale that match your own personality. Find the assessment at stp.psychmaven.com. That is stp.psychmaven.com. Have fun with it. Thank you for listening to the Scaling Therapy Practice. I hope you enjoyed the show. I want to remind you that the content shared today is for general information and entertainment purposes only. It should be considered as legal or tax advice. If you need a professional advice in those areas, please consult with a licensed attorney or accountant. But thank you so much for listening. The Scaling Therapy Practice is part of the SciCraft Network.